Is it good to be in God's presence or what? <laughs> Woo! Y'all might just have to give me a second. Not only have I just about sung my voice out, but I think I just about teared my contact lenses off my eyeballs. So I'm, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Worship band, that was awesome. God bless you guys. Thank you for always, always taking us to the throne. Yeah. Give the Lord your praise. Oh, Whew. what just happened? Okay. Good morning. So good to see you guys. I tell you what, God is doing something at the potter's hand, y'all. It is awesome. I, my hair is standing up. Not here, but right here, if you can see that. And it is fantastic. We give him all the glory and all humility. We truly reflect what God is doing. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Reset Series. A lot of you are joining us, and you may be joining us midstream and thinking, what is this about? To reset something simply means this, to set something back to its original design, to set something back to its original purpose, right? Sounds fair enough, straight enough. We began week one by resetting our heart, because that's where it all begins. If you don't have a reset heart, all else is moot. It's a moot point. It doesn't matter. You can't reset your mind, your voice, your hands, your marriages, your finances, your health. You can't reset any of that apart from knowing the creator, point blank, right? So we decided we're going to look at resetting our heart, and we learned that we can have clean hands and a pure heart. When Jesus resets our heart, we surrender to him, and then and only then can we ascend the mountain of the Lord. That's what we looked at in Psalms. Last week, we looked, took it a step further, and we looked at what does it mean to reset our minds, knowing that only he can give us that reset that we need. Because if we're all honest, at times, one or another, we felt a little chaotic, felt a little bit like you're just hanging on by your fingernails, right? Life gets away from you, things mount up, whether it's bills, whether it's stress at home, whether it's the job, whether it's your marriage, or staying, kids going crazy, that bad report you got from the doctor, you name it. There are times where we all feel like we are a walking madhouse of a man. That's what we looked at in Mark chapter 5. I love that description, a walking madhouse of a man. And we were all honest enough, we take down the mask at the potter's hand, you're safe here, to say, man, I felt like a madhouse, or I felt like a madwoman. Not me feeling like a woman, but you know what I'm saying. For you, you felt like a madwoman at times. Or a mad teenager, when you got all those chemicals, we'll just say like that, raging, right? And you just feel like, you know, and it really resonated with me. Because when I think madhouse, it takes me back to a time when I was literally trapped in a madhouse. I don't know about you, but I thought it'd be fun to go visit one of these one time. I didn't walk out this door, but this is one of those things where you drive by and you... You think, oh, this looks great. This is before we had kids, so I had Amy with me. And we pull in. I'm like, this is going to be awesome. You know, put it in park. I'm like, I am out the door. I'm like, this is going to be a madhouse. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun house. I'm expecting like curved mirrors that make you look fat or maybe skinny or like rooms that are slanted or that little tube thing you got to walk through. You know what I'm talking about? Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about with a fun house, madhouse thing, right? Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. So I see that hand. When I get out of the car, I start walking and I look around. I'm like, where's Amy? <laughs> Well, I go back to the car. Amy's just chilling, having a good time. I said, come on, babe. This is a madhouse. Fun. We got to go. She's like, <laughs> I ain't going. Have fun. Well, but this, this is our vacation. We're supposed to, it's a madhouse. It's fun. We're supposed to go do this. She's like, that is not for me. If you want to do that, help yourself. <laughs> Slam that door. Okay, I'll go. Don't come with me. You ain't going to no madhouse with me. I'm going to go by myself. I'm not mad going madhouse. You don't think you can be with me. <laughs> okay. So I walk up to the lady. I said, how much is this? She said, it'd be $10. $10? Just, it's a self-guided tour, right? I'm just going to walk through it. So I plunked down my $10. She says, what you want to do is you want to go around the corner. You're going to go through a room. The first room is going to be a little dark. The light's going to dim a little bit. And you first, the first thing you have to do is escape that room to get to the next room. I'm like, sweet. Sounds good. Couldn't help but notice there was not one other person in this entire thing. Okay. It's just me, and the parking lot's kind of empty. So I'm thinking, this, this is already a little, little creepy. So I walk in. I'm feeling, I'm feeling confident. I go, go in the first door. Door shuts behind me. You know those little candelabras with the fake bulbs that like flicker? They start getting dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And I try desperately to look around the room with the last fading flickerings of twilight. And I don't see a way out. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. And then the lights go off. Y'all... I'm already blind. You know that. I've had five eye surgeries by the time I was 27. I can barely see anything. And so I'm like feeling around the room. I'm like, man, this, this feels like a madhouse. And I'm going around and I feel like there's like a fireplace. I'm like, that's not it. I'm over here and I find a doorknob. I'm like, sweet. And I grab the doorknob and it's a fake doorknob. You got it. It doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't even turn, right? 
So I'm, I'm sitting there going around. I'm finding, okay, that's the door I came in. It's not that. Go Finally, after five minutes, now that may not sound like long, but that's a long time to be alone in a room you don't know. And I'm, I'm feeling, and I find another door. I'm like, thank you, Lord. And it's one of those, those panic bar doors, right? You just push it, kind of like what we got right here, so you can go out. So I go out, and the next room is so bright. I'm squinting my eyes. I go out, and I'm like, thank you, Lord. I found it. The door shuts behind me, and it's not a room. I'm outside. I found the emergency exit. I find the only exit that you shouldn't take, and I find it. And I'm outside. Now I turn, and the door has no doorknob, and I'm locked out. I have two options at this point. I could go back to that lady and be that guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, just, uh, I didn't make it past room one. Can I have my refund, or can you let me back in? I said, you know, I just can't do that. I, just, I, have, I have that much dignity. I am done with this. So I'm in a bad mood. Now I get to go back. Amy can attest. Now I go back to the car. And there's my wife who should have been with me. Oh, she should have been with me. Being my, open that door and I sit in the shut door. <laughs> back so soon? <laughs> Quiet. What happened? What would you do? And shut it. We're not talking about this. I felt, I felt like such a loser. I couldn't even get through the first room, right? You know, I felt like a walking madhouse, and it really resonated with me last week, but y'all, this week resonates even more. This is the risky part. This is where we ask God to reset our voice. I'm going to tell you something. I'll give you a heads up. Nothing is more risky than asking God to take control of this, to reset your voice and your tongue. But hear me, nothing is more satisfying than letting your words speak up for him. Nothing. If you haven't tried it, it is awesome. It is beautiful. It's what God intended us. So let's dive right in. Psalm 71. Pull up your Bible app or open your Bible. Psalm 71. Let me welcome those who are streaming with us. If you're joining us online, good to have you with us as well. Psalm 71. We're going to start verse 15 and read through verse 16. And it says this, my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long. Though I can't even relate them all, I will come and I will proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds and yours alone. Y'all, I want to draw attention to three little words right here. On that second sentence, I will tell of your saving acts all day long. Wow. This is a noble goal. This is a lofty goal. Talk about resetting our hearts and our minds and our voices. Is this, is this even possible? Who does this? To speak of God's glory all day long? That and only that? That is crazy, right? No, I mean, who does that? Can you imagine waking up on a day where your words speak about God's glories? That and nothing else. Because that's what the psalmist just said. I will speak of your saving acts all day long. Your righteous deeds I'll proclaim and yours alone. Do you know anyone who's done that? Do you know anyone? I mean, is this even possible? Is it conceivable to do that, to wake up, that every time you speak, you're not talking about the weather or you're not talking about that restaurant that just opened up at the mall or why the one that you like closed down and why there's a mattress store showing up every 10 feet? Is it just me? Yeah, oh, you're there. Okay. It's, imagine it. We wake up. We don't talk about, you know, our hobbies or sports. We don't talk about any of that. But we talk about him, the glories of God, and his marvelous deeds. Who does this? Who talks like this? Who lives like this? Honestly, the short answer, not many. Not many. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. The research shows not many people do this for a very powerful reason. Scientific American revealed a study that in general, we spend at least 60% of our conversation, get this, 60% of our conversation talking about one thing and one thing only. It's not Jesus, by the way. Does anyone want to take a guess what it is we like to talk about the most? Oh, you know this study. Yes, ourselves. 60%. Buckle up. In the age of social media, it gets even worse. That stat jumps up to 80% when 
when it goes online through Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. 80% talking about me. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one. Oh my, right? A little Toby Keith for you. No charge. Think about that. If you're not into Toby Keith, maybe you remember Bette Midler who said, but enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me, right? It's like, oh my goodness, the arrogance of us is astounding. It feels good to talk about us. Did you know that? Guess what the researchers found? They got 200 volunteers to come in, submit to an fMRI. That's some kind of really, really advanced MRI that's designed to scan the brain, okay? They found something they were not expecting. In fact, they said, quite frankly, they were astounded and shocked. A normal brain looks like the one you see here on the left. This is what happens when you're talking about normal things, when you're not fully engaged. But they found, the researchers, these two lobes lit up like a Christmas tree when they were talking about themselves. When they were engaging in self-talk, this is what they scanned. And the researchers said, this is impossible. You know why it's impossible? Because they thought these two regions were only associated with, you know what these two regions are called? Anybody, anybody brave enough to say it? These are the pleasure zones. Previously only associated when the brain is subjected to intense stimuli. And the researcher said they see this kind of lighting up in cocaine use. They see this kind of lighting up during when you are ingesting foods that you absolutely love. I can agree with that. Just, you're just lighting up. The other time that these light up like this is during marital bliss. Okay? All right? I just, and there's nothing wrong with it. Marital bliss is good. That's the way God intended it. It is good, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Why am I the only one nodding? Okay. It's very, very awkward up here. Whew. Is it hot in here? Let me get a drink. Okay. Yeah, it's good. The devil makes things bad. God makes things good. You hear me? There's nothing wrong with it. The church needs to claim that back. That's when they expected these lobes over here to light up in their pleasure zones. They lit up while they were talking about themselves. So now we have a double whammy. Not only do we like to do it, but evidently science says it feels good. You know how hard it's going to be for us to break this habit, for us to not just talk about ourselves? This is crazy. This is, this is the dilemma that we're facing. So on one hand, we have the scriptures we just read that says, I will proclaim your righteous deeds. I will tell of your saving acts all day long. We have that over here. And then on this hand, our flesh says, I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about no. Right? Anyone else see a huge valley here? A chasm of disconnect? Well, here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. For the heart, the mind, and the mouth that is reset on things above, we can have no disconnect here. We can have pure connection, and it is amazing what happens. When your heart has been reset toward Jesus, and your mind has been reset toward his truth, what naturally follows is a reset voice, a voice that can't help but talk about God. Think about that. That's, the nat that's our first truth today, a voice that can't help but talk about God, and we'll see why in just a second. This is what Psalms tells us here. I want to begin my challenge early. I, I want to wait for the end. What percentage would you say, don't answer out loud, you're safe. What percentage would you say you use your voice to talk about the glories of God? Okay, let's walk through it together. Let's all feel the pain together. At work, let's start at work. What percentage would you say you have a voice that can't help talk about God? Is it 80%? Is it 8%? Is it, is it <laughs> Is it 0.00008%? What is it? Just don't answer out loud. Okay, let's move it to play. We've already done work. Al. Now we're at play, okay? When you're at the game and those conversation opportunities come. When you're out fishing and those conversation opportunities come. Four. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. When you're on the course. When it was what percentage is it? What is it in your mind that you think of right now that you talk about the glories of God and you tell of his wondrous works all day long? You got your percentage in your mind? Here's the awesome part. Jesus shows us yet again why he is perfect and the ultimate example because we see him living this out with the disciples. Look with me here in Matthew 
chapter 20, chapter 12, verse 33, says this, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. I love this. He calls them, you brood of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that's stored up in him. This passage reveals truth number two we need to take with us. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. It's pure scripture. Write it down, live it, love it, learn it. This is gold. When your heart is full of Jesus, Jesus shows up in your words. When your heart is full of Alabama football, Alabama football shows up. Oh, it happens. I get it. I get it. We're all in this together. Oh, oh. Thank you, sir. May I have another spanking? We're just getting started, okay? As we look at this, there is the, the guy who came up with this whole reset movement, Nick Hall, great evangelist. He wrote a book called, called Reset. He shared a story where he was on a plane, and he was going from country to country to state to state speaking about this reset movement. And he, he was worn out. He was about to lose his voice. He was dead tired, and he got on a plane. He had a two-hour flight. And he goes and he whispers to the flight attendant, I am so tired, and I know my seat probably has people on it. Is there any way you can find me a seat that doesn't have anybody, a row that I could either just lay down or conk out? I need to rest for like just these two hours. This is all I need. She said, I'll tell you what, take your assigned seat. I'll go look with the, through, through the whole plane, and I'll come get you if we can find something. So he takes his seat. No sooner had he put his bag down, he turned around, and there is a soldier not 18, maybe 19 years old, fresh out of basic training, dressed in full fatigues, and he comes and he sits right next to him. Nick looks at him, and he could tell by just eyeballing him, this guy was stressed to the max. He was frightened. He had just been deployed to the front lines in the Middle East, and he was going for the first time. And Nick could tell, man, this guy is about to lose it. He hadn't even stepped foot on the field. And his heart went out to him. And just as he was about to engage, guess what happened? The lady comes back and says, I have a row for you. It's ready. Well, now we got a question. The call of that row, that sweet, glorious sleep from above, or a mission opportunity. Well, Nick gets up and he grabs his stuff and he shakes the, the soldier's hand and he goes to that row and he sits down and he puts that little nugget pillow behind his head and he leans back. And you know what happens. You've been there. The Spirit of God starts talking to his heart saying, what are you doing? Sleep later. You got a chance to share me. You got a chance to speak up. Nick wrestled for a minute. I can't do it. I'm tired. God, he'll think I'm a Jesus freak. God, he, he wants that row for himself too. I left it. I did him a favor. He has his own row. Look at the good I'm doing for you, Lord. Well, you know what happened. He got up. He grabbed his stuff, and he went back up to the front of the plane. He goes, I know you're probably as happy to see me <laughs> take your row as I was to leave the row I had by myself, but I couldn't help but think how stressed you were. And I got to tell you, I wanted to know if maybe I could just speak a few words of hope to you and maybe just pray for you. The guy lit up like a Christmas tree, and he said, that would be awesome. He sat down next to him. Guess what happened? That next 90 minutes that they had left on the plane, that soldier prayed and asked Jesus to reset his heart. He gave it to the Lord. He surrendered. He saw the peace. Because he, he, he was able to speak words of hope. Why? Because the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Scripture's so true. This is it. We see it happen. When your heart is full of Jesus, church, Jesus shows up in our words. It can't help it. It can't help it. Okay? So how you doing with that? Moving on. We'll see that as our days go, we saturate our minds with Christ and with his scripture. And surrounding ourselves like you're doing today with like-minded believers, you will see that you will start to talk less about trivial things and more about eternal things. You will see that you start talking less about how hopeless your situation is and more about the hope giver. How cool is that? And people will notice. You will see that you stop talking about fads and what's trending and more about the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who tells us, come to me, take my yoke on you because it is light. I will give you rest for your souls. He gives us that beautiful option. Now, here's the cool part. 
These situations that I'm talking about, they won't be contrived. They won't be forced. They will come automatically. God will put them in front of you. They'll just happen. When you choose to reset our soul and saturate our minds with Scripture, the more we will find ourselves doing this thing in Psalm 71 that who does this? Who talks about people? Who talks to, to people about God and his glories? Who does this? Who does that? You can. We can. We should. Which brings us to the third truth and our last truth today. When we see that opportunity, seize it. Oh my goodness, when you see the opportunity, don't let it slip away like Nick almost did. Right? He was sitting on that plane. He could have walked away, but he went back. There's no shame in that. He did the right thing. He at least was moldable by the Spirit to go back. That story of him with the soldier at its core is all about seeing an opportunity to speak truth and then seizing it. Do we? Are you open to that? Man, I hope you are. I bet we are. I know this is challenging stuff, but that's why you come. Now, who was the best at this? Who's the ultimate example? Jesus. And he gives us another example. This is so, Jesus, the, the name that is better than every name, the name that is so sweet. We need to be in the habit and get comfortable with saying and speaking the name of the Lord and not in an exclamation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We need to be comfortable speaking his name. It should flow easily from your lips. Does it? Answer that to yourself. Okay. How, how, does it, how does it flow? I remember being new in the ministry. I was a freshman at Sanford University. We were at Divinity School, and I was looking up to the senior, and he was, he, he was like, my, like my Yoda. I was like, oh, how do, I, how do I share Jesus like you? How do I do these kind of things? And I remember he was talking about a guy who he had just seen. He said, man, Matt, you wouldn't believe this guy came up. He was so stressed out. His fiance had just broken up with him, gave the ring back. His bills were piling up. He wasn't even sure if he could finish Divinity School. He was having, or he, he was, a friend of the divinity school. He wasn't sure if he could finish Sanford. And he was, he was so freaked out. And I said, what'd you say? And he goes, I looked at him and I said, sounds to me like you need Jesus. I almost coughed up my food. I said, what? That's what you, you opened with that? That's how you led with like the right hook, the haymaker? And he goes, yeah, didn't have any time, man. This guy needed Jesus. He was about, he was suicidal. We, and I said, you can't do that. You can't say you need Jesus when God opens that door. You can't, you, who starts there? Who does that? Who, what if, what if you said the wrong thing? What if you botch it? What if you blow it? Want to hear the most amazing part? Put your steel-toed shoes on. Here's your warning. Here's your warning. You ready? He said, God can use your botched attempt, Matt, but God can't use your non-attempt. Oh, <laughs> deflate. Ministerial student. <laughs> He said, God can use that feeble attempt. At least I spoke up, Matt. He can use that. He can take it. He can make something good. You know why? Because his, his, his word never returns void. But you know what he can't use? Oh, why? <laughs> Silence. He can't use nothing. Speak up for him. Be bold. It is risky. Is it messy? Yeah, you bet it is. But it's the most rewarding way you can live. Are you looking for purpose? Are you looking for passion? Are you looking to be excited to get out of the bed in the morning? That's what this is talking about. God can't use your non-attempt. Jesus was the master at this. I love this. He wasn't like the parent who says, uh, do as I say, not as I do, right? We've all had that. We've all been at Walmart and seen that parent screaming at the kid. Stop screaming. You're screaming too much. It's like, man, where do you think they learned this? The kid's screaming back at him. They're relating like that. You've been... Jesus didn't do that. Jesus was the ultimate one. What he said we should do, he did. What he said we should say, he himself shared, and he said, he spoke truth. Do we? We're going to go into that a lot next week, okay? This week's about how to speak for the Lord, what to say. Next week is about <laughs> what we shouldn't say, how to rein in our tongue. You don't want to miss it, okay? It's going to be fantastic. Bring your steel toe boots. You're going to love getting spanked. It's fantastic, I promise. <laughs> Jesus spoke truth here, and I remember reading this story. I just saw this of an IRS agent who called a pastor at a church. He was sitting in his study, and the phone rings, and he says, uh, he hears the voice on the other end. The IRS says, hello, is this Reverend Jones? He says, yes, it is, replied that pastor. And he says, well, this is Bill Johnson, and I'm with the Internal Revenue Service. Now, that's not a good call ever. But the pastor was nice and gracious. And he said, I was wondering, pastor, if you could answer a few quick questions for me. Uh, I'll try, said pastor. He says, do you know a John Timmons? Uh, I do. 
is he really a member of your congregation? <laughs> he is. And did he really donate $10,000 last week to your church? <laughs> he will. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine that next phone call? Hey, John, this is Pastor. Man, I just heard about that $10,000 donation. That is awesome. Where is it? <laughs> right? He spoke truth. Jesus spoke truth. We speak truth. He spoke love. We need to speak love. He spoke kindness. He spoke boldness. He spoke compassion and healing and peace and joy. To the wind and the waves, he says, be still. Jesus literally spoke peace. Do we? To that man with the shriveled and withered hand, he spoke healing. Do our words speak healing? To Lazarus, he said, come forth. And a once dead man came back to life. He spoke restoration. Do we? He speaks rest to the disciples and says, come away with me. Y'all, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let, this is the dress rehearsal. Don't be so stressed out that when people look at you, they get a horrible picture of Jesus. You with me? Man, this is so deep. And to every one of us, he speaks hope because he says, take heart. I have overcome the world. Are you panicked? Are you stressed out? Are you freaking out? Are you hanging on like that madhouse of a man with just your fingernails? He speaks, I have overcome the world. Take heart. I will come again. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come back. I will take you with me. It is incredible. The list can go on and on. Here's my question for us. Does the world still need to hear messages like that today? Man, absolutely. Guess what? <laughs> we are the ones who are supposed to say them. Wow. We get to speak these words of life. Y'all, is there anything cooler on the planet than being able to share that, to play that role, to be the ambassador for Jesus? Think about that. Man, that is weighty stuff. You don't hear that every day. Is there anything more noble, a higher calling than that? To speak these words? For you don't have to be a pastor. In fact, it's probably better that you're not because you will reach people that I will never reach. Did you know that? There are fish in your pond that just frankly, they see me coming, they run. <laughs> That's okay, it comes with it, I get it. You will have a circle of, uh, of influence that I will never be able to reach. And, and, and I bring them, if you can, bring them, I'll do my best, I promise. I will always preach the truth and I will never, ever, ever get up here unprepared, ever. I promise, I will do my best, but you got to bring them. And some of you are doing that. You're doing that awesome. Did you know the last two weeks, we have consecutively, two weeks in a row, broken the attendance record at this church since I've been pastor? Two weeks in a row. You guys have done that. You're bringing people, and that is awesome. Keep it up. You might have done it again today, but you got to be willing to speak life, to speak hope, to speak truth. And if you are scared to do it, then we offer these events all the time for you to bring people. I'll try. But are you even open? Because here's the deal. We just looked at it. God can't use a non-attempt. He can use a feeble one. That's okay. We're all there. Lots of attempts. Man, I'm glad you all don't see some of my feeble attempts. I wish I could say they were always in my 20s <laughs> or my 30s or my 40s. But there it is. That's how it works. Here's two quick takeaways I want to leave us with today, okay? Are you ready? Get your pens ready for this. Two quick takeaways. Here's the first one. If you've allowed Jesus to reset your heart and your mind, and you are about to ask him to reset your voice, don't be surprised if God hears you and he gives you opportunities to speak up for him. Okay? That is a gold nugget. Do not be surprised if you've already asked him to reset your heart and your mind, and now you're ready to ask him to reset your voice. Don't be surprised if these opportunities come. Okay? They will come. And they will come when you are least expecting them. I promise. Be ready. I remember not long ago, I was at Great Wolf Lodge. Anybody been to Great Wolf Lodge? Whoo, yeah, there, there's something. <laughs> Your feet die because it's concrete everywhere. But I remember Marin and, and Amy went off to one side, and I was with Milo. And I had my phone. That tells you how much I was getting in the water. <laughs> and I'm sitting there texting Amy, where are you? How much longer? <laughs> Look at this. And I'm waiting for Milo to get in line to go on these green lily pads. You know what I'm talking about? Where you got to run real fast or they sink. <laughs> I tried it once. <laughs> I think they're designed for ages like, like two and under. And Milo was doing awesome. He comes back and he gets back in line. And I noticed that he's talking to this boy and there is no line. They just kind of backed off. I'm like, what is he doing? Hurry up. You know, I got to go. I got to go over on that side and be bored. So I'm sitting here texting away. Hey, where's Marion? You good? Good. And I lean over and I'm like, Milo, would you guess what he's doing? 
He's asking this boy in front of him if he knows Jesus. Couldn't believe it. I was like leaning up. I did not hear that. And I look. He says, do you know Jesus? It's okay if you don't. But if you do, I would love to be able to pray with you. It's very straightforward. And, and we, can, we can do that. We can, even, we can pray together right now. I was just like, who does this? This is that thing that we're supposed to be doing. He was doing it. Daddy wasn't. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you know, I know it's just me. I know, I know it is. And I am the worst pastor ever. And I freely, I freely admit it. But here's the deal. If you surrender your heart and your mind and your mouth to Jesus and you say, God, bring the opportunities, <laughs> he's going to bring the opportunities, which brings us to the second takeaway for you. When those opportunities to speak for God show up, seize them. Seize them. It's not rocket science. Reach out and hug it because he's given you this golden opportunity like that soldier on the plane with evangelist Nick Hall. Seize those opportunities. Don't be shy. What are we shy about? Be bold, church. Here's the deal. The enemy, the enemy's not shy. Have you seen the stuff he spews? Have you been online? Have you, have you looked at television or movies or listened to songs? Think about it. The devil is not shy about spewing his wickedness and his racism and his hatred and his wickedness and his perversion. He's not shy at all. Why are we? Why? What? We have the answer. We have the hope. We have the life. This is crazy. We shouldn't be shy. Here, be the kind of man or the kind of woman that when you wake up in the morning and your feet hit the floor, the devil says, oh no, she's up. That is what you want. When your feet hit the floor, it's like, oh, battle beginning again. Got a prayer warrior here. She's fixing to speak up. She's fixing to be bold. That one's got a reset voice. Oh, watch that one. That's what you want, Right? To be known throughout the the realms of the enemy? To go, man, stay away from that one. That one will rebuke you in a skinny minute. That That is it. Don't be surprised when you're given an opportunity to speak for God. And seize them when they come your way. When you're asked to speak up, do it. When you're on a flight and you're tired. When you're at work and you'd rather not stay a few minutes late, but this person has opened up the door for you for the gospel. Seize that. When you're at the restaurant, the grocery store, wherever. Because Ephesians 5 says this. Be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every opportunity. That's it. There it is. There's your challenge. God has placed people in your path, in your sphere of influence. When you leave today in a matter of minutes, it might come your way. Are you going to seize it? Or are you going to, I'm going to use a non-attempt. Don't do it. Don't do it. I wonder who in your circle of friends today needs to hear a word of hope. Who in your circle of friends at work, at school, in your neighborhood, needs a word of encouragement, a word of of optimism, a word of love? Who is begging you? I want you to think about this. Who in your circle, even if it's silently, who is begging for hope? Here's the challenge for you. I want you to think about one person, family member, co-worker, who is it that needs hope? And I want you to pray for him. You know who it is because the face probably just went right through your mind. Who is that? Who is that one? Okay, that's the one. In just a minute, I want you to take that name before the Lord. Who is God putting in your heart? Who is God putting in your path that you can speak boldly for him? Man, let's be known as people whose voices have been reset to speak for him. Let's be bold. And when those opportunities come, let's seize them, okay? Let's pray about it. God, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that you have loosed our tongue to declare your glories. Lord, if it's not all day long, I pray you would move us in the right direction towards some of the day. May we speak about you and your mercies and what you did to save us from ourselves, to redeem us, to make a way where there really, frankly, wasn't a way. God, I thank you for your presence in this place. Move in our hearts. We lay names before you, faces before you, families before you and ask that you would provide that opportunity to be bold for you. We do this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. We waited for this day. We're gathered 